Our final department of the day is the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. Could I ask everybody to please leave quietly? We want to continue our hearings, please. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? Please identify yourself and proceed. Good afternoon. Um, I'm David T. Jones, the uh, Commissioner for the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. I first i uh, like to uh, acknowledge my uh, fantastic staff and, um, and, and uh, as evidence of how fantastic they are, I ask the uh, council to uh, please view the uh, video that's being uh, queued up that um, uh, gives um, information about how to uh, access uh, behavioral health, uh, intellectual, and uh, early intervention services. Thank you. Welcome to Philadelphia's Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. A citywide network of more than 200 provider agencies offers effective, compassionate care for all Philadelphians, especially those with intellectual disabilities, mental health conditions, and substance use disorder. At DBHIDS, we promote resilience, recovery, self-determination, and wellness in children, adolescents, adults, and families. Providers located throughout Philadelphia offer a full range of treatment options in the community, including individual, group, and family therapy, substance use treatment services, early intervention and intellectual disability services, crisis intervention, and case management. No matter what your situation is, there are many pathways to gain access to care. It's never been easier to get the help you need. You can call Community Behavioral Health, the division of DBHIDS, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to learn about the best options to meet your needs. In times of emergency, we offer mobile crisis teams, urgent care centers, and crisis response centers for adults and children. We also have a broad continuum of substance use treatment, including prevention and early intervention services, school-based programs, peers and certified recovery specialists, and so much more. And our community programs empower the city's entire population to take charge of their own health and wellness. Help is here. DBHIDS, educating, strengthening, serving individuals and communities so all Philadelphians can thrive. Welcome to the next. Okay, thank you. Hear it again. So, um, again, um, good afternoon. Um, I would just say President Clark and uh, President uh, Councilman Greenlee and members of City Council. Again, I am uh, the David T. Jones, Commissioner for the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability uh, Services. Joining me today is Dr. Jill Bowen, Deputy Commissioner. Um, I am pleased to provide testimony on DBHIDS's fiscal year 2019 operating budget and have submitted my full written testimony through the Council for your review. DBHIDS is responsible for serving children, youth, adults, and families in Philadelphia with behavioral health challenges and our intellectual disabilities along with early intervention services and acts as a safety net for some of Philadelphia's most vulnerable people, making every effort to ensure Philadelphians have access to treatment, supports, and services. One in five individuals will deal with a behavioral health issue in their lifetime. Behavioral health disorders are highly 
uh, prevalent in our communities and are just as devastating as physical health diseases. Uh, DBHIDS has an annual budget of about $1.58 billion to address behavioral health, intellectual disability, and early intervention needs. Um, Philadelphians, 99% of which comes from state and federal resources. Uh, the remaining 1%, which is about 14.2, um, is uh, allocated from uh, two DBHS from the city of Philadelphia. We serve over 170,000 Philadelphians had received uh, treatment services and support through our provider network. Uh, regarding the opioid epidemic, it has become ever more apparent that addressing the opioid epidemic uh, that plagues Philadelphia will re require creativity and ingenuity. Over the past year, DBHIDS has continued to work towards addressing the crisis with the inclusion of the implementation of the recommendations from the mayor's task force to combat the opioid epidemic. With the progression of the opioid epidemic in Philadelphia comes the emergence and increase of individuals who are experiencing homelessness due to the complexities of substance use disorder and decreased access to housing vouchers. Efforts such as encampment resolution strategy pilot, including collaborations between DBHIDS, the Managing Director's Office, uh, Office of Homeless Services, Police Department, and provider agencies such as Prevention Point, Project Home, and One Day at a Time are, are available and to address and resolve such challenging issues. Uh, DBHIDS staff has been focused on enhancing crisis services and support, supporting children and families, including uh, through our mobile crisis, mobile intervention, urgent care, and children's crisis response center. We continue to strive to ensure that services and supports provided are family-centered and engage not only individuals seeking services, but their natural and chosen supports as well. Additional programs, um, I would really be remiss not to mention the incredible work of the uh, Intellectual Disability Services, or IDS. IDS serves uh, over 7,500 children, youth, and adults with an intellectual disabilities annually, and additional over 7,000 infants and toddlers receive um, early intervention services each year. In serving additional unique populations, our Refugee and Immigrant Affairs Unit continues to fight to ensure equitable access to behavioral health resources for individuals from our refugee and immigrant communities throughout Philadelphia. Our ongoing community-based programs include Network of Neighbors, a program that engages with community members after violent events, um, and Engaging Males of Color, which seeks to engage with and connect young men of color in efforts uh, to connect them with treatment. Uh, overall, DBH, uh, IDS, uh, community-based programs seek to facilitate part partnerships within the community and craft strategies that promote holistic wellness through recovery, resiliency, and self-determination. Moreover, DBH IDS remains committed uh, to increasing stigma around mental illness. Our partnership with Mural Arts, which creates community connections and a platform for engagement, connected um, over 550 community members this past year and served as a vehicle for the promotion of inclusion, personal, and community healing. Uh, in closing, we certainly appreciate the ongoing support of Council and the opportunity to highlight behavioral health as well as intellectual disabilities. We look forward to working with Council and other stakeholders to advocate for resources to support our most vulnerable people. As was done in the past, I personally invite any and all Council members and their staff to partake in mental health first aid training. I also extend an invitation to participate in porch light tours, uh, DBH IDS's partnership with Mural Arts. You guys know Jane Golden is, and uh, Mural Arts are wonderful to work with. Uh, my staff and I welcome the opportunity to meet with Council members at your convenience to engage in further discussion regarding the content I've presented for you today. At this time, I'm happy to uh, respond to questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, let me go right to the members. Councilwoman Sanchez. Good afternoon, Mr. Jones. Good I want to thank your entire team. I know that over the last year we've had some really difficult public conversations, and I appreciate the opportunity to always work with you in a very honest and transparent way. So I know that um, my questions are somewhat difficult sometimes, intenseful. Uh, and very similar to Liz, your uh, demeanor sometimes uh, calms me down. Thank you, um. Councilwoman. Can, 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 can we pause for just a second? <laughs> you gonna give me a hug Come before? On, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think he, I think he's a politician, too. <laughs> <laughs> Look, da da Dave is a great guy, and I never doubt the, the, um, the commitment by the team, the work that needs to be done in this portfolio is quite complicated. And so when, when we debate, it's not because we, I don't believe people's intentions are there, but I also know that in a bureaucracy this big, if we're not as intentional and as transparent in public, then we don't, you know, 10 heads are better than two, right? 
And so with that, I wanted to talk a little bit around the governance structure. And I really appreciate our former colleague who's, who, who came around and gave us the annual report. I really do want to appreciate, um, you know, and I know you've been working on a lot of this as you took over the reins of this department. Um, this kind of information, I think it's hugely important. Uh, I think to the extent that people are informed about what we're doing and how we're doing it, whether they agree or not, at least they can see some of the work that's being done and I, I, I do appreciate that. I want to talk a little bit around the governance structure around CBH. You know, it is an entity that celebrated 20 years. Um, I, I noticed that you have a full complement of, of your board of directors. Tell, tell me, how far have you come and where do you still think um, there's work to be done as it relates to that, the management of the organization? So uh, before I even speak uh, specifically to kind of the governance structure, I think one of the things that I want to highlight about uh, community behavioral health as a health plan first is that kind of the efficiency in which it operates. So, um, you know, it has among the lowest uh, administrative overhead rate, so it's operated about an 8% uh, administrative uh, overhead. Uh, they retain uh, no profit, uh, about 92 cents of every dollar uh, goes towards uh, treatment, and uh, they are completely uh, dedicated to serving Philadelphia. And so, and, and let me, just to, to you know, to, to dive into that a little deeper, so what can happen at different times is if you have a health plan that uh, receives profit, part of the way that they continue to ensure that they obtain profit is they um, really limit the, uh, the amount of benefits. So they offer, uh, offer a very kind of uh, narrow benefits plan. And one of the things about community behavioral health is that it's, um, it's a very robust plan. In fact, I would say that if you compare it to a number of private plans that in fact there are more services that Philadelphians who are Medicaid eligible or and, and receiving behavioral health treatment are able to receive than they would uh, through a private insurer. The other piece that uh, also sometimes uh, happens is you will see a plan really um, increase our, their, their denials. So as opposed to really kind of authorizing services, that's a way of really kind of controlling cost. And that's also something that you don't see uh, happening very much with community behavioral health. So I think those are all tremendous strengths. I think that we have expanded um, in terms of the governance board, and, and, and part of that, candidly, um, Councilwoman, was you know in, in response to uh, people you know like you who uh, wanted to make sure that uh, that there was a, um, a kind of a broader look, and that we were leveraging um, the um, th that health plan as much as possible. Um, we, as you mentioned, in terms of speaking with the DHS commissioner, so we've added uh, the DHS commissioner, we've added the health commissioner, we've uh, actually added. Um, Liz Hirsch as OHS, um, the uh, deputy managing director has continued. We actually also have people with lived experience. Um, and so, um, and then along with uh, the uh, superintendent um, of schools. And so I feel like uh, there are uh, a number of partners who are invested in making sure that um, we are using uh, those uh, federal Medicaid funds that are highly regulated, that we are using uh, those funds quite well. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the, the next natural steps really are uh, figuring out how, uh, when we look across kind of all of uh, the, the, the broader city and, and then even, you know, to the, to the dare say, kind of private sector, how um, any of those resources are best leveraged. And so I think that's really kind of the next step. Would you, would you be opposed to council um, making some board appointments in there in addition to the cabinet members that are in there? So what I would be open to is having conversations about what that might look like. Okay. Um, I think it's hugely important that in this portfolio, given the gravity of everything that's going on, and I, again, I think those appointments are key, having Liz there, having um, Cynthia there, having the school district there, those are all your strategic partners, and um, it's unfortunate those, those things don't happen organically, right? It's sort of like you got to push that, right? got to push the envelope and say, folks, let's bring in these partners so they have skin in the game, right? And, and we, can, we can get it moving. Um, so yeah, I, I welcome that conversation. 
question um, about what that looks like. I um, want to talk a little bit around, you know, you know that one of my biggest issues has been around the federal investigations through some of the treatment centers in, in what I call my storefront, stop and go mental health providers, right? I'm going to create a new term, stop and go mental health providers. Um, what are we doing to ensure that doesn't happen again? And again, we, I've asked for a process and a written process for how we shut these centers down. Um, so where are we with that? And give me the one, two, three things we're doing differently um, so that we can better hold those centers accountable. Yeah. So what I would say is that, um, again, I, I think we, in terms of quality oversight, have um, a fairly um, robust process. I mean, I think that we have network improvement and accountability collaborative. We also have a kind of a quality assurance. We have a, a compliance arm. And then um, what's also very unique is we have uh, a consumer But you had those team. before we had the four that had a problem. What are we doing different now? I, I, you know, so one of the things I, I got to combat is the stigma about that kind of fraudulent behavior in my barrio. So what are we doing differently? What I tell people in the community that we're doing differently now? Because all of those compliance issues were in place before. Well, so, but I, I think that part of, uh, so what we're doing is we actually are um, using what we have, I think, more efficiently. I think that part of the, uh, the what we have added is we are working um, uh, in concert with uh, other uh, community uh, organizations. So, uh, for example, um, the, um, the Latino Coalition uh, mm -hmm. is, is an example where uh, part of the way we are going to get information um, around uh, where you have a provider, and, and I should back up and say that, you know, so the vast majority of the providers in the network perform really well. I mean, you you know you're mm -hmm. talking about um, mm -hmm. you know the outliers, and so we really agree with you in terms of for those outliers, we want to be able to address those. We are um, the community. I think at times will get information. So cer certainly, folks who are receiving services, as well as again. Um, uh, uh, entities like the Latino Coalition that we are meeting um, more regularly with uh, them just to say so what's working well with the system where do you uh, where have you identified that uh, there may be challenges in terms of a given provider and then going out uh, to address those challenges I think what the other thing is we are um, given the um, the, the, the various kind of quality measures that we have in place, we actually have people who are uh, more actively going out. So uh, what a, a change has been uh, when we get word that there is a more challenging provider actually deploying a team that goes out and takes a look um, and then are more intentional about interviewing not only the staff that are involved but also um, having uh, people speak with um, those individuals who have been receiving services. The other part of the challenge sometimes is we may have information about a provider. There also may be a federal investigation that's going on, and that federal entity will ask us, not mm -hmm. will ask us essentially to kind of stand back, allow them to conduct. Now everybody's their entitled to a process, and so you know, and that I also is always a part of the process. So I just, and you know, I'll, I'll go into my second round. Um, I want to get some updates. Uh, Several years ago, I've made the request around recovery houses and how are our providers who have five, six person match per property, how are we doing around reviewing those, um, uh, those? but uh, my time is up, I'll wait. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Councilwoman. And the Councilwoman uh, referred to him, but we just want to formally uh, welcome uh, our former colleague and former Speaker of the House, Dennis O'Brien. Good to see you again, sir. Yes. Uh, Councilman Reynolds Brown. Welcome back. <laughs> um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And um, uh, we appreciate the important work that you do every day. That should never go uh, unrecognized. So this morning when the Office of Emergency Shelter was here, I spoke about the need for what you already do a card that provides a hit list mm -hmm. of the type of services that um, families and individuals in distress can go to. My question to you is how wide reaching is this particular effort? And the reason why I ask is 
this past weekend I was at 38th and Spruce at the Wawa and there was a, a woman there with her 11, 12 year old son in distress that was quite uh, heart wrenching and I was not aware of where there might be seven day a week, 48 hours a day uh, services for someone who was clearly homeless mm -hmm. and lucked up upon Councilwoman Blackwell who was a block away both of us headed to the same event and she was able to tell me uh, where we could refer this family. So the reason why I ask how out far reaching is this, my thinking, and it's purely exploratory, my staff and I only had this conversation this week as a result of Starbucks, um, before we get to the 911 to call a police officer, Wawa's and 7-Elevens and stores like that need to have or know given this situation at my front door where I have customers coming in to make an assessment and then call the appropriate office agency that can help a family or an individual in distress. Mm -hmm. so, so is this reach beyond government? So, um, Councilman, we really uh, make every effort to uh, our, um, as part of uh, planning um, and innovation with, within uh, our department, uh, they go out and attend a, a number of health fairs um, and make sure that they try to, uh, throughout Philadelphia, disseminate just this kind of information. The other thing that we also try to do is, similar as you saw uh, portrayed on uh, the, the video, is to make sure that we actually have that one 545-2600 number out so that that's available 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year that uh, folks can really access that. In addition to what, we, what we've also tried to do is through um, pay for performance. Uh, so we really try to in incentivize. We contract with kind of all told throughout the department probably over 200 providers or so. And so part of what we tried to incentivize them to do is to, um, uh, through kind of, you know, again, uh, health promotion, uh, talk about, uh, get out in the community and share what services they provide and then have information like this available so that uh, the community can be more informed about what is available. Mm -hmm. So we really try to make sure that we go uh, much further than beyond government. The other piece is, is that we also have what we try to do with um, smaller, uh, with uh, what we refer to as our community coalitions that typically include um, a faith-based organization, a community uh, organization, um, um, a, a behavioral health provider. They all come together as a coalition. As we give uh, through, through that coalition kind of coalescing, uh, we uh, ask them to make sure, again, that they're disseminating information. And we try to make sure that that, again, happens throughout uh, Philadelphia and that it hits um, the various uh, different communities so that it is um, that we are being as culturally competent, mm -hmm. recognizing that we have uh, people um, who uh, reside in Philadelphia who are not at all comfortable with the idea of coming to government to get information, but then using these community coalitions as a way that we're able to disseminate information. So we really try to use you know various means Cast and portals to convey that, that information. Exactly. Okay. I, I'm going to discuss with Councilman Dom offline how we can intersect with the business community about what you're offering. Because sometimes it's businesses that ultimately suffer when they're not comfortable uh, entering establishments because of a family being in crisis. So we'll talk about that offline. Uh, thank you very much for this graphic illustration of what's happening on the MBE, uh, WBE side. Unless I am, this speaks to board, board uh, positions and board compositions. That's uh, an improvement. How are we doing with regards to spend with MBE and WBEs by these agencies that are funded by you? Mm -hmm. Is there some tracking of that kind of information and data? So what I will tell you is that um, of our um, 15, I think, um, highest um, grossing um, providers, um, I think three of them are um, minority led. And so, um, and, and the reason it's probably not larger is that we also actually have um, among our provider agencies a number of hospitals and those kind of things. So it, it would, it kind of would skew the numbers. So I think we continue to be uh, very um, conscientious around making sure that um, we are um, 
make, uh, help supporting our uh, minority uh, women and disabled owned businesses mm -hmm. that um, we uh, recognize that they um, play uh, a particularly special role um, in Philadelphia and so again I think we, we have some data that demonstrates that um, by and large uh, that they are uh, growing and uh, they may not be growing um, at the uh, at the percentage or proportions that they would like to see but I think we we actually have some information that shows that they're growing okay please you want this you want to are you going to add to the testimony Go ahead, just speak, just state your name and then. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Jill Bowen, um, newly arrived to, uh, to this department, happy to be here. Um, Deputy Commissioner. Talking to the mic, pull it closer Deputy to you. Deputy Commissioner for DBH Ideas. You actually need to pull it closer to you. How's that? That's far better. Okay, I just wanted to add that um, for CBH's provider network, 177 providers, 46% of them are minority women or disabled owned and um, 17 uh, providers for STS. Um, the top two in revenue in number of um, schools are minority providers. And in terms of the medical spending, 51% um, of the spending are, are minority or women, which is an increase up from 40% over the past um, several years. So they are making um, some progress there in terms of the medical spending. Uh, you say uh, medical spending? Yes, the, the direct um, spending for the medical services from... Um, and, and, and to be clear, when Dr. Bowen is saying the medical spend, that's actually the spend to per for treatment services. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about printing and uh, food services, and your legal services, and your accounting services. It, it, are, are those type of professional services um, being a, a track for all the providers who are benefiting from the funding that you provide to them? So um, that so we tend to actually um, so our focus is uh, is, is obviously more on uh, the primary contractors that we have that are providing treatment. Uh, we can actually uh, take a look and see if, as it pertains to some of the su those would be sub subcontracts, um, what then uh, the spending of we'd have to look at that and then get back to you. Okay. All right then. It, uh, so going forward. Know that that's a, a standard question that is raised with all departments. Nobody gets a pass okay. because if folks are being funded by taxpayers' dollars in this city, then the expectation is that they, where as appropriate, hire local and spend local and spend with women and minority-owned businesses as well on the professional side and the non-professional side. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman Councilman Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to thank um, you for being here, Mr. Jones, Commissioner Jones, and your other staff. Also, thank you for participating in our public health and human services um, hearing that we had uh, a little while ago regarding the issues and concerns of um, behavioral providers of color. I know that on a regular basis you've been meeting with various providers of color regarding those issues, and I think from my understanding from that hearing you're expanding that to some of the groups that participate in that hearing to participate in that regular conversation. So thank you in that regard. Um, earlier I was um, asking some questions um, to our health commissioner um, regarding issues of treatment uh, as I was talking and my asking questions. I'm not sure if you had a chance to listen to some of the questions we were talking about the issues of opioid addiction and the crisis we have here in the city of Philadelphia. I uh, was made reference to the hearing um, that Councilman Sanchez had in her district, um, what we had in the community. I know you and others from the city have been having this conversation regarding safe injection sites. Um, one of the issues that I was exploring with Commissioner Fairley was in reference to the fact that um, we have a number of people that need treatment, but we don't have enough treatment for them. Uh, and so one of the things I was exploring with him, and I want to get your feedback is in reference to um, the fact that a lot of our um, public safety and criminal justice referrals um, tend to go to people who sc are screened for a THC screening, mm -hmm. um, which I'm sure you're familiar with is the um, chemical in marijuana or cannabis that's being used for both probation and parole, and those people are being referred to 
treatment facilities that could be used by people who have a uh, opioid addiction. So um, uh, we'll be preparing for hearings on that issue, but I'm curious for your perspective on that aspect of how referrals, um, primarily for someone that is in a probation and parole situation, being referred to treatment that could be being used for people who have opioid addiction. So, so uh, a very good question, uh, Councilman Green. And uh, one of the things that, so uh, just a couple responses. One, and I think um, Dr. Farley did allude to the idea around our um, number of medication assisted treatment slots that uh, in fact we uh, currently have capacity so it's it's a bit counterintuitive to think that we're in the middle of an opioid epidemic we have probably over um, 8700 uh, medication assisted treatment slots so and to be explicit you know so that then includes uh, methadone buprenorphine or suboxone and vivitrol and that we probably are um, at about 79 percent of capacity so clearly that we we have um, more treatment slots available than are being utilized right now and the uh, and certainly the concern that you're raising around someone who might have a primary uh, uh, diagnosis around of cannabis uh, using essentially um, residential beds is, is, is where I think I understand you're going. And so I think some of the, um, just a couple points of clarity, the, um, so what we're seeing uh, candidly is that um, overall, if you look broadly, um, our uh, most significant spend is on substance use disorder. And then if you look and when you drill below that, uh, drill down into that, um, you know, opioid use disorder is probably among uh, the highest and you have certainly uh, alcohol use and then alcohol. and cocaine, cocaine. Right? right? And so what we're finding is that um, um, that those are really the uh, kind of uh, primary uh, diagnosis uh, in, with, uh, as it pertains to substance use disorder who then are uh, participating uh, or get, are being connected with kind of the, the treatment beds. It, it's only uh, probably I think uh, approximately like 3% of folks who um, have um, like a, a cannabis in terms of uh, as a diagnosis and they really, uh, our data doesn't demonstrate that they actually are um, accessing um, uh, treatment beds. I think what um, what the data that you may have received, um, so it typically uh, is a co-occurring so that uh, it may be that somebody may have an opioid use disorder and cannabis and so um, it's those individuals again who more likely would be um, accessing um, our treatment beds as part of um, uh, as, as part of their kind of treatment uh, continuum, uh, less so uh, anyone who uh, would have a primary diagnosis uh, that you, of cannabis. Okay. Uh, thank you for that information. As we continue to explore our issue, uh, I think I hear what you're saying is that, uh, and what I understand is that cannabis may be a subcondition, but the primary driving condition is either cocaine, alcohol or some type of open condition. That's, that's correct. Um, and that's from reference to treatment beds. And I, I seem like, it seems like you're making that as a distinction versus other type of treatment that may be ordered by way of um, uh, criminal justice, which is different than the treatment bed that you're actually talking about, if, if, if I'm correct in my understanding. Yeah, and so I think that you had, I think you had uh, also asked some questions around um, um, uh, individuals who are, um, and I, I will say broadly, who have maybe behavioral health um, diagnosis who were um, in, the, um, uh, in the prison system. And so, you know, what, we, what I can tell you about that more broadly is that uh, what we're seeing again, and this is probably on average, is that um, as folks come re-enter um, into the community, um, approximately, and this is on an annual basis, about 2,000 individuals are coming uh, out of uh, Philadelphia, Philadelphia's Department of Prison uh, with, a, again, a broader kind of behavioral health <laughs> diagnosis. So whether that would be um, um, mental health or substance use, about 2,000 of those folks uh, annually are coming in and then being connected with our treatment. And now that includes um, individuals who may have been uh, behind a wall who were um, participating in, um, in medication-assisted treatment. It may be folks who uh, had some involvement with uh, probation and parole. Um, it, you know, it may have been someone actually who also had some involvement at some point in time with another component of the criminal justice system. But about 2,000 of those folks on average are coming out and then being connected with treatment. 
Well, I look forward to having uh, continued conversations with you and Ron Lane from your office to continue this conversation as we move forward on this issue. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Dom. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Good afternoon. I just have one question I wanted to ask. I wanted to make sure I understood this correctly. Okay. Your budget's a billion five hundred eighty-six million, roughly. Approximately. Yes. Of which less than one percent, fourteen million, comes from the city. That's correct. So I don't have a ton of questions on this, but I do have this one question: Is the money that we're getting from the state and the federal government, I guess, is any of that at risk under the new administration? So um, what I'll say is that we end up getting about 55% um, of our budget is uh, from the state, 44% um, is uh, federal. Um, I think that, um, candidly, there's always some risk, particularly because of, um, you know, we, we operate um, Health Choices, which um, is a Medicaid program, and so to the extent that we would see um, reductions um, to um, Medicaid, that would certainly have an impact on our budget um, in, in the future. Are you forecasting that to be a problem or you think we're going to be okay? You know, um, it, if I am um, so, it's a it, part of the challenge for me, um, Councilman Dome, is that um, I am, I always try to be um, as honest as possible. And um, as I think about the um, federal administration and uh, being able to predict what, the, um, what may come out of uh, that administration, it's difficult to say, um, you know, from day to day, what's consistent versus inconsistent. Right. And so there are... You're being a, diplomatic, sir. I'll just yes, put it that way. right? <laughs> so I, I would say that um, there is nothing imminent uh, but um, we, we continue to, to plan just in case. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You talked around that very well, sir. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Some of us would be more uh, direct than that, but that's okay. <laughs> Councilman Sanchez. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of questions, but let's, let's talk a little bit around this Q's um, uh, situation. Because of the city... Um, saying that they are not going to manage the center, that they would be doing the wraparound services, I'm going to assume that most of that money is going to come from your portfolio. Um, we had an opportunity to meet Councilman Squilla and I with the police officials from Vancouver. And I think it's important that we put this in context. Uh, how are we doing with our barriers to access to services, you know, i.e. the identification requirements that Vancouver doesn't do, um, uh, the minimum income that Vancouver has, and obviously the robust housing and affordable housing that they have. One of the things that troubled us the most when we talked to the gentleman, the police official, was that overdoses are on the rise still, right? And all things being equal, a cue doesn't mean you don't have all the other things going on at full steam ahead. Treatment, you know, public safety doesn't change here or there. You know, you still have to have a robust public safety plan. But one of the things that really concerned me is that they still have an increase of overdosing. And in fact, they are now in the process of prescribing heroin directly because of the fentanyl. Um, how do you see this this kind of project being operationalized um, in light of the kind of services that you currently provide? Yeah. So it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, and I think very, very much a fair question. Um, the, when we think about the comprehensive user engagement sites, and, um, and we had the opportunity, um, as you point to, also to go to Vancouver and visit, uh, there are a couple things that um, stood out, and, and, the, and the one data point that I think uh, is difficult to, in fact, I think it's, it's, it's almost impossible to debate, is that um, they, uh, within the, what they refer to as a supervised injection facility, uh, they never lost a life, right? So they never had a death. 
And I think part of when we talk about the comprehensive user engagement sites, it's part of a broader continuum of strategies, this being just one of them that helps us keep people alive long enough to then get them into treatment. And so I think that um, it would, um, it, it, to some degree, be irresponsible of us not to take uh, uh, advantage of every opportunity that was presented. And so uh, when we think about, again, the comprehensive user engagement sites, um, we recognize that it is also an opportunity for a partnership with um, the private sector, and it's the point you make that, you know, so this wouldn't be, uh, tax, taxpayer dollars wouldn't support it. Um, it would uh, be, you know, privately funded, privately operated, um, and then as people made a decision to um, come into uh, treatment, much like uh, currently, they certainly would then be able to benefit from um, kind of the robust array of, 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 of services and supports and treatment that we have now. I think part of what we're also trying to do is, as you ask the questions around, you know, some of the barriers, is, is at every uh, point of the way remove any barriers. And so the, the barrier around um, identification um, isn't uh, for accessing uh, treatment for, you know, mental illness. It's, it's not actually even accessing treatment for the most part for co-occurring. It really is specific to the narcotic treatment programs, and that, again, has been um, you know, kind of federal legisla uh, legislation, we, federal and state, now part of what we've also done is we are working uh, with the state, and I think also can certainly use you guys' help on this, which is to say, so um, in terms of the um, actual regulation that says, you know, what is it that a provider has to have? Do they have to have a photo identification of David Jones? who is coming in seeking treatment, or do they just need to have, um, you know, the uh, policy that speaks to how they are identifying so that I am who I say I am. And so we're continuing to do uh, that work with the state. I think we've actually uh, made some uh, progress. And so that, you know, as we get that and um, clearer, we feel like we, you know, any idea, uh, ID barriers, again, we really are trying to, we want to move. Or any entry barriers, which, again, I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, you know, one of my concerns around this whole debate, outside of being called a murderer, right, because I'm unwilling or still unconvinced um, around uh, some of this, particularly because of the encampments, um, and how do we assure people that we're going to protect their quality of life, right, right? right. Um, as, as the, the, the occupation of folks who don't have control of their lives continue to control our neighborhoods and what we do. One of, one of my um, issues with this is that there's this idea that what we're doing right now isn't resulting in good results. I mean, I think what we've learned over the last year, as tenseful as this has been, is that the work at Prevention Point, the respite bed, the wet beds, right, all of those things also serve as a point of entry into people, into the system, right? They have been effective, right, in engaging people and putting people in treatment. And when housing is provided, getting them into transitional housing. So my question to you is, as we continue to debate that, and you guys can have all the conversations you want, um, why, what, how much more are we going to do of what is actually working right now? Yeah. So I think so. Two responses. One is I think that we um, we are committed to uh, continuing to support providers uh, who are um, out. You know, again, so prevention point one day at a time. We talked about. So Liz talked about if, increasing. If, if, 60, just, if I, let me just, if I can just just finish this point, just because yeah, I, I just more? right. I mean, so that we are going to do, and then I think what we actually are introducing that's also working that hasn't necessarily gotten as much light candidly is like, for example, um, our recovery uh, overdose survivor engagement. So the Rose Project, where we actually have um, peers, people with lived experience, certified recovery specialists who are at uh, Temple Episcopal, right? And so to give, to share some data, so those, um, those certified um, recovery specialists 
uh, stationed uh, at, at uh, Temple Episcopal for the month of January, there were 125 individuals who um, came in. They either had their um, overdose uh, reversed with Narcan or were at risk. Of those 125 that came in, 78 were connected with treatment, right? Mm -hmm. So that's actually starting to show, that's showing right. some effectiveness. And what I will say is that, so it'll take, you know, more time. And again, it's going to be kind of a, a combination, obviously, of intervention strategies that go way beyond, you know, right. certainly our so department. So my question turn is, how many more web beds and other beds that we have with ODAP and others are we increasing this year? Because that is something we know is working. So right. I want to know right now now what are we going to increase with what we know is working as we look at that other option yep. um, as part of the portfolio because I, I do agree there has to be this whole continuum of care yep. right not every everybody needs different yep. well, how much how many are we increasing um, as we uh, open up another respite and a potential engagement as we dismantle the encampments right so I think um, um, the um, Liz Hirsch talked about um, that there, we are looking at opening uh, 40 additional beds. I think a question you raised, uh, Councilman, Councilwoman uh, Keonia Sanchez, was um, the uh, idea around uh, recovery houses, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the other place, candidly, mm -hmm. where we have the opportunity to expand, and that's where we're looking. So we're at about, in terms of within DBHIDS, is, uh, portfolio, we're at about 333 beds now. Mm -hmm. And so we recognize that, you know, so we would like to expand, but part of the issue becomes th there's been some um, more recent legislation that has come from the state that then gives standards in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, what they have to adhere to. And essentially, the, the new regulations include standards now like um, standards around staffing and what that staffing should look like and they should be available 24 7 and then that there should be explicit connection with treatment i think if we are able to you know get um recovery houses to adopt those standards and then we can support them then that's how i think we can expand what works and so we're having those conversations now um, i'll have to get back to you in terms of a definitive number because part of it is we'll have to have those conversations to see who can really adhere to those standards before we can say what definitive numbers will look like so how many of the the the, the property matches have we identified and how have we worked through them Yes. Yeah, so, so again, we're I think we're at about uh, just in terms of speaking specifically recovery houses, we're at like 333 mm -hmm. or, or so now. Now, I, let me also just in terms of candor, there's some accordion effect in that. So we are at 333. Sometimes uh, when they're not adhering to standards, we we don't continue. You, we know that, for example, you would have a concern with someone who's underperforming, and so we pull them out of the network. So again, I I, I don't I don't want you to feel like uh, I'm not being um, uh, explicit in answering the question. Part of it is is that we have to have more of the dialogue before I can then get back to say, you know, this is what the number <coughs> would be like. <coughs> okay, my time is up, but um, I can keep going. I keep going. All right. So let's talk a little bit around those standards, because as you know, I've visited as many as I get invited to, right? Um, and in many of those, in many of the cases, and obviously I work with Fred Way and some of the work they've been doing, in many of the cases, some of these houses needed very little support to, to reach a level of standard that's somewhat adequate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what are, so how, are we setting some, what investments are we going to make in those to keep that 300 yeah that are, you know, might they're, you know, they need some kitchen upgrade, some bathroom upgrade to accommodate. How much in this year's budget are we looking to do to support those? Yeah. So, um, again, I think that that's the conversation that we have. So we actually have uh, people, obviously, uh, in-house, uh, internal to DBHIDS, uh, who are working uh, closely with Fred um, and others to say, okay, so, you know, um, if we were to um, categorize recovery houses, so there may be, let's say, 10 that fall in the category that you just mentioned, which is, you know, say they need some, uh, I'll, just, I'll refer to it as kind of infrastructure upgrades in order mm -hmm. to meet the standard. Mm -hmm. Um, we then would have those conversations to say, so, because candidly, so we don't necessarily have new dollars mm -hmm. to address this issue. It really would be 
reallocating some of our existing dollars because we mm -hmm. feel like then it's a better spend. And so I think those are the conversations that we're having. And so we're trying to figure out exactly kind of, you know, so what category would fall into they need to do the upgrades, what, um, how many are actually ready, they just haven't necessarily, we, we, they haven't um, submitted what they need to submit to us mm -hmm. to then come into our network and they're already ready to go. They could be operational in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So we are going through that process to delineate who falls in which categories and then I, I think we can better answer the question in terms of, you know, when we'll be able to stand them up and then how much we'll expend. Okay. I think it's important to the extent that we're making public, like, who are the bad providers, right? I get people, I, as you know, I shared with you, I visited someone last Friday. Very well-intentioned, right? They think that, you know, there's going to be all this money, right? Yes. And they're setting up, right? And then um, they have a situation that's um, not adequate, not something that, that, that I would support, right? Um, so how are we going to make that process public so that we know who kind of the bad providers are or how do, let's do it the reverse because mm -hmm. we're always being punitive. How do we identify the good ones and give them kind of a seal of approval? Yeah. How do we do that? Yeah. That's a, so I, I think that's a, that's a, a, a great question in terms of, you know, holding um, those recovery residences up who are, you know, really not only hitting the standards, but, you know, surpassing the standards. And so, again, I think that, you know, part of our process is to have, you know, continue to have uh, the conversations and then be able to, um, I think, make investments in those, and, you know, let, let's say that that's a, you know, provider X and mm -hmm. with those provider X. So I think that, you know, again, that's a process that we are kind of exploring and, and is underway right now. Um, the other thing that I will say, and, and this goes beyond uh, recovery houses, is, you know, um, Councilwoman, in, in terms of our efforts to work with you, one of the things that we, and you'll recall that we share with you too, is we actually even came up with kind of a template in terms of mm -hmm. here are what, mm -hmm. you know, providers, you know, here's what they look like over kind of a, a, a wide array in terms of the number of folks that are being served, um, whether they receive paid for performance, um, um, whether they had any compliance issues, uh, that kind of, a bit of a rating uh, kind of uh, uh, no, and I think that was a, a good rating first profile step. that we have shared with you. Right. So, and I think part of when, how we'll get there, I think, is, this, is to, you know, reach some agreement in terms of does this look like what you guys want and then be able to take that from kind of a pilot to scale. Part of, I think, the, the dialogue is, is we do want to make sure that there's at least, that we're, we're giving you what you're asking for before we try to scale that up. Okay. Well, I think, again, I want to know, I want, I really believe that there should be a patient's bill of rights. I want to, as a patient, I should know that I'm going into a center that ha is on a provisional license, um, lost a license before, you know, whatever those, I sh that I should know, right? Um, so that I have the real choice, right, as opposed to um, being tied in. And I think um, facilities is a, an important component, just like the rooming house facilities should have standards. I think some of these facilities should have standards. They should look like they're conducive to people who are in trauma or in recovery, right, as opposed to some of the stuff, you know, I, 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 when I say, you know, storefront, I mean that very facetiously because it looks bad, right? That's not a, an appropriate setting that I would want to send my child, my mother to, and I think we shouldn't fund anybody whose facility doesn't look adequate, isn't clean, um, where counseling is happening in the hallway, you know, those types. There should be a standard, right? And I should be able to walk in a facility and have some sort of, this is a good provider, meets basic standards. Um, and I think we should have that in the recovery houses too, right? If a recovery house is affiliated with a provider, right? If I see something wrong in that house that I can call that provider and say, if housing stability is part of your treatment plan, that's not working, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so connecting those dots, I think, are hugely important so that we destigmatize the bad stuff, right? Yeah. And, and, and reward the good stuff. And so hopefully we'll get people to step up and say, we can do this in a way, you know. And obviously I understand always their, their funding challenges, but I, I, that's where I want to get to a point of transparency, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that when people come to me, and you know I have no problems when people come to me and say, that ain't gonna happen. Um, 
it's just not going to happen. <laughs> Um, I probably know way too much about building standards as Chair of L&I, but I just, to, to, to add to that. Um, and Council, let me just, because I want to respond to a little bit of just the statement, because so where we completely agree is that, so we don't want anyone in a, you know, receiving substandard treatment or substandard, uh, re, you know, in a re substandard recovery residence. We absolutely agree. I do, I do want to be explicit around, because um, it, it, just uh, the patient bill of rights. So uh, there is actually, we have, uh, through uh, Community Behavioral Health, actually there is a patient bill of rights. It's, it's actually on our website. And so I just wanted to make sure that, so that uh, people know that they should then be able to go and know what's the, what they can expect. The other piece, too, is that, you know, I think what we've also have on our website that uh, that is uh, gives a little bit more clarity around is uh, evidence-based practices, which providers are utilizing which evidence-based practices. So, for example, if you had someone who have, uh, has experienced trauma, um, you know, that you um, would be able to say, okay, so they actually have therapists trained in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. I'll have so that, to that, find that because I didn't find that. All I saw was kind of the spreadsheet, which I appreciate of okay. providers, but I didn't see some of that. But okay. I'll, I'll and, go and we'll, that. And we'll make sure that it's it, it's even uh, more apparent, but it, it absolutely exists. So because I wonder if, and then go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, and then so I want to get to the you know we've talked about educating doctors around prescriptions. How are you able to hold our doctors accountable for over prescribing and what things do you have in place to see which doctors are prescribing what particularly the ones that are working for us on a fee-for-service basis yeah so what we've actually put in place and I think this is you know this is in large part um, our um, doctor uh, doctors uh, Neemark and, and real and they've actually done some work with um, with uh, dr. Farley as well is actually so we have uh, Developing what the essentially uh, the equivalent of a um, um, I, I don't want to call it a report card because that that wouldn't be accurate, but it's something similar where physicians are getting information about their prescribing practices in comparison to um, other similar uh, um, in, 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 t in terms of other specialty. And so um, they are receiving that information and then if in fact they are, um, if you will, kind of an outlier, then there's actually a follow-up that they actually are receiving um, from um, someone within um, our, our department to highlight the fact that, you know, their uh, prescribing patterns uh, and practices practices are, are, are putting them, you know, kind of putting others at risk. And so we actually are um, conveying that information. Um, I think that actually has been, we've actually been operationalizing that for, I would say, you know, it's relatively new. So it's only, it's been maybe a month or so. But I think that's in fact what we're doing. So when will we be able to see that and monitor that? Because ultimately until you fire a couple people, people are just going to keep doing it, right? Yeah. We learn that's the way it works. Yeah. Just like yeah. we don't disbar people. If you don't fire people, people aren't going to stop. Right. So what are the incentives and then what are the consequences that you foresee as you move this along? Right. Well, I certainly see that the, the, you know, the consequences uh, being one of which um, you know, they are informed around the fact that they are putting uh, essentially their, what would be the equivalent of their patients at risk at one. And then secondly, I see a consequence in terms of um, from a financial consequence in which, you know, we will certainly say we're not going to continue to um, contract with individuals who are not adhering to uh, best practices. Okay. Um, one of the issues that I learned around some of the, some of the, problems we had with some of the back, back, bad actors was our ability to monitor their work hours. What matrix, matrix have you put in place so that, you know, you know, I always talk about too big to fail. You know, the agency gets so big, right? One doctor seeing, I don't know how many patients, you know, I, I'm very dramatic when they come to me and I calculate the hours. I'm like, how do you get 26 hours in a day when I only live 24? Um, what are we doing about that? to make sure that doctors are adequately reviewing therapist case files versus um, 
you know, them just signing off on caseloads. Yeah. So I think, so part of what, uh, what's happening too is, and as I had mentioned before, through um, kind, of, uh, kind of our quality assurance through uh, NIAC, what's happening is uh, we are certainly looking at a, a kind of a couple of metrics, one being um, around the number of people, for example, who um, are at a given, and I'll, I'll say just outpatient clinic. It may, it could be any different level of care, but I'll just use that as an example to then say, okay, so um, are the numbers so large that uh, that in and of itself is a red flag? And so we're looking at that. And again, I think part of what's also happening is as the various kind of chart reviews are happening, as the conversations are happening in terms of um, um, individual uh, choice and, and, and folks feeling like they are indicating that they don't necessarily have choice. We're looking at, again, a number of metrics like that and any of them that are generating what is the equivalent of a red flag, I think we're responding to. So you will have that kind of number, baseline number when? What are you looking at as best practice around how many um, therapeutic hours can a doctor actually provide, right? Yeah. We have them for bus drivers. You know, you can't drive more than 12 hours. you got to take a 20-minute break. Um, when are we going to have something like that for doctors? Yeah, so, I mean, so you're really asking about kind of practice standards. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that um, what I let – me, let me circle back and talk with the team to figure out, because what I don't want to do – is uh, give a timeline that we uh, aren't in a place to adhere to, and then have you say, well, you said such and such. So uh, let, I, I will circle back and we'll get back to you. Well, know that I will be on you about that. I think you guys need to, um, you know, we've talked a lot around some of the public transparencies. Uh, I asked you about board representation. What is the status around your board meetings being public? or at least board minutes being made available on a regular basis around your decision making? Yeah, so I think that we will, um, we have uh, looked at um, and, and uh, our bylaws. I think that we are uh, making some adjustments and amendments and that what will eventually happen is by fall, we'll have um, a, um, a schedule out that then indicates um, you know, when the board meetings uh, will be held, um, you know, uh, what the expectations will be for um, individuals uh, who uh, are not part of, so essentially kind of from the, you know, public who didn't want to participate, how they want to participate, I think we'll have essentially guidance out by fall. Okay. In your annual report, you talk about people's ability to file complaints. Um, what, if any, reports can you give us about the kind of complaints that are, are filed? Mm -hmm. how they are resolved, um, and any which have led to a policy change as a result of thematic things coming up. Yeah. So I, th I think that we can, um, um, we can give kind of um, aggregate in terms of kind of thematic complaints. We can likely give that information um, in relatively short order because we have that information now. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Uh, the question really around, you know, how, how we do that in a way where there's a systematic report out, that I think we'd, I'd have to, you know, get back to you on, but it just in terms of, you know, uh, and people certainly have, we, you know, we have a fraud, waste, and abuse uh, that right. anyone can call at any point in time and say that this is the concern that they're having. That's, all, all that information is available, and just in terms of being able to access and, and make the report, that's obviously available now. The, 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 the thematic uh, themes that would come out of that, I think, again, we have it. We would just have to be able to get back to Okay. You Those are the kinds of things that I would hope as we move forward to add to transparency, people will be able to see, right? Just like we want to know, um, you know, the police officer that may have gotten, you know, a bunch of reviews, right? We, we want to know. People should know. Um, I think that adds to the public accountability of um, the providers, particularly in the medical field, in light of all of this opioid addiction and everything else, is like we want to know what what are the patterns we should be looking for, right? What are the matrix, the standards, all of those accountabilities? And I think your portfolio is so huge that we really need to work with 
through that in a quicker way so that we know, right? What are the standards? You know, just as we work through how do you evaluate your providers so that people don't feel like they're grandfather forever and that they can be whatever kind of provider and quality standards are not going to be established and sustained and maintained. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think we need that for everybody that works in that field. Okay. Particularly the doctors, my concern around some of the doctors that freelance with several providers, mm -hmm. you know, are we really able to get a handle on what they do for this agency versus this agency when we have that? How do we monitor that? Um, and everybody wants to go. I'm getting a look. Councilwoman, oh, absolutely. Sorry, Councilwoman. Good afternoon. Councilwoman Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon to each of you. Good afternoon. Um, I want to uh, just start a line of questioning um, specifically relative to uh, CBH and the uh, an issue that has been of extreme uh, importance in discussion in all that we do here in council, and that is relative to the issue of diversity okay. and inclusion. Um, yeah, I know now um, a as a result of um, all of the national, right, the global attention um, on the atrocity that has uh, become known as the Starbucks fiasco, mm -hmm. right? We are hearing people um, place great focus on it on this term, you know, implicit bias, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're hearing it frequently. But we here in council have been talking about diversity and inclusion specifically relative to the workforce, that is the municipal workforce and the management level. Uh, you'll, you'll recall uh, Chairwoman Reynolds Brown and, and Councilwoman Canonez Sanchez raising the issue of the rule of two relative to rebuild. We talked about you know those who would benefit from doing huge business with the city of Philadelphia and diversifying the building trades in particular. We needed to focus on making sure that that workforce reflected Philadelphia's population. Um, it is with that in mind that, that I want you to walk me through the racial makeup of the population served by CBH. Okay. okay. So what, what I'll start with, if, and if you want to um, pull the information in terms of the, the breakdown. So what I'll start with is that I think that the, the, the way that um, in terms of CBH and who they serve uh, generally reflects pretty much the the demographics of the, of the city. So, and let me start with the more of the, so their their staffing is uh, forty five percent. Um, so I mean, instead of instead of the staffing, if yep. we could, I want to start with the population, those okay. the, the clients, those who are being served. The, you 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 mean so? Uh, I don't want to be um, the explicit. Uh, Councilman Parker, to make sure that I'm giving you responding to what you're, you're the or the provider network that's that's within is that is that the, is that what you're looking so for? So CBH contracts with the provider network Correct. that services residents of the city of Philadelphia, right. and you have different agencies across the city that provide uh, alcohol and drug abuse, mental health. I want to know when you look at that population. That, that world, mm -hmm. serviced by providers doing business with CBH, what is the racial makeup of the population receiving services that CBH pays for out of its okay. budget? Okay. Let me pause for a second. Um, you guys have, can somebody give me that information? That population um, is 53% for the most part African American. Okay, 53% uh, African American. 23% uh, Latina. 23% Latina. 19% uh -huh. um, Caucasian. 19% Caucasian. Um, one and a half or percent Asian, and uh, uh, just about uh, all, just about three percent other. 3% of the, okay, all right, this is a good start. This is a good start. Now, now with that being said, when we, the providers that you, that you just referenced, CBH works with a group of providers who actually, you know, are the boots on the ground providing the service. Give me 
the racial makeup, if you will, of the when the firm. So we know when a firm is considered to be a majority minority firm mm -hmm. that that is functioning. Would you be able to tell? Give me a, a, a racial ethnic makeup of the firms that are providing the services. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm going to look to um, let's see. So it appears as though okay. So this is um, actually the uh, data that um, Deputy Commissioner Bourne had indicated earlier. So, um, it, out of about out of approximately 177 providers, one, about of 177, uh huh. Uh -huh. About uh, 81 are um, minority or female led. Minority or female led, uh huh. Which, um, which is uh, percentage wise, I think is about 46 percent if those numbers add up. Uh huh. And um, the the 60 of the 81 are led by females, 21 are uh, led by um, minority, um, or led by minorities. Now that also could be a minority, typically and women, minor or male. Right. Yeah. Okay, no, and I, listen, and I, I appreciate you being very um, direct and okay. uh, providing your response okay. and sort of getting right to the number yep. uh, that I wanted because if you were to just have given me that 81 number as being minority and or female, we would have wanted to sort of break down okay. that number yep. to figure out what was what. If you don't have this information on hand right now, uh, that is fine. I will ask that you just submit it um, uh, uh, to the chair so that it can be distributed uh, to all uh, members of council as we begin to uh, walk through this budget process. And that is out of this uh, this 81, um, and out of all of the 177, it would be interesting uh, for me to see the uh, the ethnic. Uh, and the, the sexual breakdown of the provider's leadership, or gender rather, so race and gender breakdown of these providers, their leadership and their staff. In addition to that, is there a quantifiable number that you are able to attribute to each firm? So for example, if we have, a, you told me 177 firms, 81 are minority and or female, 60 of the 81 are female, 21 are minority. Mm -hmm. Now I would like to see the dollar amount, the dollar amount that is, of business that is done with each of the, of all of the 177, but the 81 in particular, and I'll tell you why this number is extremely important to me. I don't care if we're talking about teaching in the school district of Philadelphia, I don't care if we're talking about, you know, working in the private sector, hence Starbucks, this issue of cultural competency is real. When you talk about a city with 43% uh, percent of its population uh, being African American and even over half of your the population that CBH is serving being African American the importance of leadership and management and at the board level at these respective agencies that benefit from doing business mm -hmm. with, with quality of services that are provided for some of our most vulnerable citizens I wouldn't care if the providers were black white green yellow or purple uh, a quality and professional services being first and foremost but we have to be very intentional about making sure that cultural competency is um, an issue that we are paying attention to as it relates to providing opportunities. Now I'm referencing referrals. Now I'm referencing any opportunity that there is for a firm to, um, to gain capacity, mm -hmm. uh, to grow mm -hmm. in, in the amount of business that it does. And I am not certain that we have paid a as close attention as we should and I know it's something that I, I have not uh, done that in, in the past um, but this is my first term here in this body to um, 
ask these kind of questions, and it is one that I will uh, be Councilwoman Reynolds Brown laser focused on uh, in the future because I am uh, happen to be home in the Ninth Councilmatic District to several uh, providers of, of mental health and, and substance abuse. And I, I will tell you, when you look at the constituency, sometimes we don't think, and all you have to do is go and sit down and listen and talk to the clients about how they feel when they're going through the intake process. The level of sensitivity, the level of understanding, the understanding of what's happening at home, trauma, impact on kids, family, what drove them to actually come and see and to see the value of being able to sit across from a competent professional who's well-versed in what he or she is doing, but is also well-versed in cultural competence as it relates to the ethnicity of the person being served. So I'm, I'm going to, uh, Madam Chair, uh, hope to see that information come to us so that we can measure what firms, particularly those that fall in this 81 category, and what I want, really want to do is compare the work and the, um, the, the amount of the portfolio, uh, I would say, of the work that is being referred to these 21 minority firms compared to the rest of them that are doing business uh, with CBH. And I, I thank you so much for your patience and for being direct. Some folks are not direct and get squirmish when you've got to give that data. So I appreciate you getting right to the point, and I look forward to receiving a response. So, Councilwoman Parker, just a couple things. One, um, we certainly appreciate um, the questions, your energy. So, again, my goal is eternal life, right? Mm -hmm. So all I'm going to try to do is give gives truth at the end of the day. So you're going to see me squirming that much because that's where I'm trying to get to, right? The other thing is, is that we are, um, even though I'm not, we'll, we'll certainly get the information that you ask, we'll get it out to all of uh, council. The, the piece that I do want to say is that we, just in terms of, we certainly agree around a cultural competence. We recognize that even the stigma um, that uh, around people who uh, would benefit from behavioral health treatment continues to be a challenge, and we recognize that sometimes it's actually even more a challenge uh, in uh, communities of color, uh, given all of the challenges that, that they actually have to um, uh, kind of overcome and combat. And so one of the things I do want to mention is that um, our Engaging Males of Color initiative that um, we have rolled out for the last couple, three years, um, it's under uh, Deputy Commissioner Roland Lamb and, and Gabe Bryant does a phenomenal job and certainly uh, works with the city, but part of that, that strategy has really been about reaching out to uh, males of color in particular broadly uh, to have them share stories around their uh, both emotional health and wellness uh, so that we, uh, as a way to invite others to come in um, and uh, actually begin to, one, begin sharing their stories, but also feel more comfortable with uh, participating in treatment because we recognize the role that, um, you know, as you have an individual whose wellness intact, how that, in fact, holds families up and then, in turn, holds communities up. So, you know, we actually are using uh, very, I think, non-traditional approaches to achieve that goal. So I wanted to put that on the record as right, well. Right, no, I appreciate that. And Councilwoman, uh, Madam Chair, I thank you so very much uh, for the leeway. I'm fortunate we're not jam-packed, right? Yeah. But I, I do want to I do want to say for the record, while I appreciate the proactive stance and you're noting the non-traditional uh, methods that you are, are using in order to raise awareness about this issue of cultural competency, um, I have often uh, heard that um, uh, from management. But the, 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 the proof is in the pudding, as Grandma would say, when you begin to look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. And now I'm talking about, um, from a business perspective, the, the value of the portfolio, who's being referred the work, how are we, aside from the, the health side of this, clearly from the now the business side of it, how are we working to enhance the capacity of minority firms that are number one competent uh, in what they do, but in ensuring that we're being very intentional about making sure that the referrals uh, get there. And so I'll be very much interested in sort of cross-referencing that along with the data yep. uh, that you send us. So thank you so very much for your response. Absolutely. Council Councilwoman Sanchez. Um, yeah, 
if we can, when, when that data, data is submitted, if we can um, codify what's a for-profit and a non-profit, yes. particularly for the board of directors, because I think this is one of the few portfolios where there's a lot of for-profit mm -hmm. folks that we should know that, right? Yes. Um, I'm going to recess, Madam Chair. I, we might have to call Behavioral Health back, but if not, we have a pending hearing. Um, our continuing series as we look at opioid addiction. Um, in terms of follow-up, uh, the data around what new investments we're going to be doing around opioids um, in terms of beds and stuff, if we can get that before the end of the budget process, that would be helpful. And just one, one point of clarification. So the majority of, of our contracts with the provider uh, networks are with nonprofits. So I would okay. say, yeah, so it's nonprofits. So so, so just point, and, and so point of point, point of information. I, I, I just, I just say for, for yeah, me, it, for I, me, I yeah. just want to state for the record. Notice that I appreciate making the distinction between what is for profit uh, and what is non profit, and that's important for us to know. But I don't sure care is. if they're non profit or for profit. Right. We want the data for all. And, and, and I, I want, I just, I wanted to be explicit. We certainly will give the data for all, but I just wanted to say, so you know, it, it's it's upwards of about ninety six percent of the providers. Wow. Are right nonprofits about so that means only about four percent. So a very small um, segment of our portfolio are with for profits, and candidly, most of those uh, are our uh, early intervention providers. And we actually are obligated, uh, based upon the arrangement, because of it being an entitlement, wow. we are obligated to contract with those. Uh, for profits because they hold contracts with the state, and so then we have to kind of fall in line. So I wow. just, so I just, just to make sure that again, that's on the record. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I, I need the, the information around the opioid stuff, there was a lot of conversation earlier today, and I know you were here for some of it, but with Liz, um, a, a, as well with um, with others around the encampments and how much money we need mm -hmm. to break down the encampment. So I don't want to. Um, not have that not have you included in that there is an expectation i know the administration has a plan that both councilman school and i have said is not adequate for the dismantling of the encampments um and that we need to know what it will cost to 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 close them down um notwithstanding the pilot that we want we hope is effective um but i think there continues to be an expectation that we're going to wait around all summer. Um, and that is not the case. So we want to know what the number is mm -hmm. that would take us to close down the foreign campus. So actually I have some, I can give you, uh, Councilwoman, a little data on that. And this, and this, is, um, uh, this is not exact. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so we think that just in terms of if you, um, if you look at the kind of the different categories that would be included. So... Uh, if, as we talk with one of our providers, you think about staffing, mm -hmm. you think about housing as a component, and then kind of the ancillary supports, which would include, for example, utilities, furniture, and those kind of things. That ballpark, uh, that ends up being about uh, $28,700 annually uh, per person. $28,000. So th that is the $150 a day bed? So what? What you consider the safety? So this, the safe the, haven? this, so I would actually, so this would be more uh, if if the if the goal was uh, more permanent supported housing, not uh, transitional housing, housing. That okay. that's what that number represents more. Okay, so that okay. So we when when Liz turns that in, again I. I continue to believe that this population is very different than than most population and that I don't think half of the people in the encampments are going to take the services and the treatment, right? Mm -hmm. I hope they do, but right. my sense from talking to folks um, and talking to the folks there, because um, I think part of our challenge is, one, figuring out what's it going to cost, how many beds we're going to need to move folks, and then the or else, right? If people don't take the treatment, mm -hmm. you know, what is going to be the line in the sand about not allowing, you know, the beds and the tents and everything else that's going mm -hmm. on in the public right away? Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, thank you very, very much. <laughs> This uh, committee will stand in recess until Tuesday, April 24, 2018 at 10 a.m., at which time we will reconvene in this room, 400 City Hall. Thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. You're welcome.
Yeah.